Well, everybody knows that dogs need exercise and that a tired dog is a happy dog. Well, a dog park can be just like Disneyland, singing and dancing and carrying on with other like-minded dogs until somebody doesn't play nice. If you ever had an experience like that at the dog park, it doesn't make them all bad, but we need to know what we might get into and, and you know, mitigate the risks. I think it's important for dogs. In fact, we have scientific, very strong research that shows that dogs need to be socialized with other dogs. It's part of who they are. Dogs are a very social species and they have a strong need to get off territory and enjoy the company of other dogs. You know, that running around and playing chase and picking up all those scents. And I'm not just talking about the scent that, of the dog's own body that they leave behind when they run around the place or the scent of stool and urine and there's no shortage of that in a place like a dog park. But dogs also secrete little communication chemicals, tiny little glands between their toes secrete what are called semiochemicals, a lot like pheromones, and they actually leave messages. And so dogs need to read those, and they can't do that in their own, thank you, Carolyn. Thank you very much. I've got a couple of visitors already, but I can't read it this far away on my iPhone, so Carolyn will give me the iPad. I know who the heck's looking. <laughs> anyway, um, in case you folks haven't met me, I'm veterinarian Dr. Jeff Nickel and Miss America. Sit up and say hello to our friends. This is Miss America, the Nickel Family Border Collie, and this is Gaston, and this is Tony. And um, we, uh, we have wonderful pets. We're very fortunate. Uh, no real behavior problems here, but we set them up for success. And we're going to talk about that with, well, there goes one of our little indoor hunting feeders. It's on the, it's on the floor now. It's the way it goes. Um, here, Gaston. Here, baby. Ah, thank you, Carolyn. Okay. Oh, Martha's here. I am delighted that you're here. Um, and I'm going to, oh, and also, well, Martha, uh, and Sid, wonderful. Thank you for being here. Yeah, and you folks can hear me, I hope, right? If you can, would you hit the heart button and that way I'll know that, you know, I'm uh, sharing some useful information, I hope. Uh, so these little guys um, have a very strong need for socialization. And people, you know, they apply human logic. I mean, these are our, our best friends, right? And they spend a lot of time with us, especially so many of us working from home uh, through the epidemic. And, um, you know, that's pretty good social contact. Yeah, but you know what? We need multiple and varied experiences in our lives, and they need to be human-specific. And dogs, they have a lot in common with us, but they need canine-specific behavioral opportunities and that means off territory, where it's neutral turf, where they can en engage with other dogs. It doesn't mean it works for everybody. So I'm gonna read you a couple of stories that sort of demonstrate a little bit of this. Here's a question and it says, we had our three-year-old Parson Terrier for one year. He's affectionate, good-natured, and mellow. Doesn't get a lot better than that, does it? Except when he sees anything with a loud engine. I think what she means is hears. Um, he goes completely bonkers, barking, straining on the leash, jumping and spinning and making noises that a neighbor described as being, ready, skinned alive with a cheese grater. Oh, I would make noise, yeah. Anyway, he also does this if he sees another dog while on leash, and at the dog park, he plays normally. As my teenager asks, what's his damage? And those teenagers have Great wisdom, don't they? Um, I know I was a lot smarter then than I am now. So here's my response. It is likely that somewhere in your dog's past he was badly frightened by a loud noise. Not for sure. There are some dogs who are innately noise sensitive. His resulting fear-based aggression is a self-rewarding behavior because it's validated every time those scary monsters leave. And I'll give you a good example. Miss America, this little border collie here, she's been with us since she was a kid, and um, she is pretty well behaved, um, but she's pretty serious about protecting her territory. 
And so when the UPS driver comes, or FedEx, and there's a package, and I order medications and other supplies and supplements for the pets I treat, and so they come to my home. I don't practice medicine here, but that's where stuff gets delivered. Well, um, those folks show up, and they drop the box over the fence, and she raises just all kind of ruckus and runs the fence, and they fire up that big brown truck, and they drive away, and she comes back going, still got it, right? That is a self-rewarding behavior because that intruder always leaves and it immediately follows her raising all that noise. It's sort of like the rooster taking credit, the crowing rooster, you know, for the sunrise. Anyway, there's no way to make this dog stop that stuff if she continues to feel like her job has just been validated. And that's perfectly okay. So in this dog's case, um, he, he's also frustrated and he'll never be actually allowed to bite those scary monsters. Um, you know, the, the noisy vehicles. And that is frustrating because dogs really need to chase stuff away from the territory. And the more agitated they get, the more they need to actually do what they're hardwired to do. You know, again, dogs and cats, well, dogs in particular, not that cats aren't. Tony T, you're drinking my water again. He shoves his face as far into this little glass of water as he can. To, Drink out of my glass. Anyway, so uh, if our dogs were free living, you know, they're domestic creatures and they belong with us, but if they were free living, which they're really programmed to do, live with a group, a feral group of dogs, like on the reservation, for example, which we have a lot of that here. Not always a good thing, but it's a reality here. Um, and somebody comes near their territory they can chase them off and keep on chasing them. And if they give them any grief or try to carry off resources that our dog's group brought home, you know, food resources like a carcass or breeding females or the young, that protective dog might carry out an aggressive event quite justifiably. And that hardwiring, that behavioral programming is genetically burned into every dog's brain. Tiny little dogs, the dogs that are the closest pets who would never hurt anybody, they all have those innate behavioral tendencies and behavioral needs. And so, hello, Cindy, thank you for coming. So, our dogs need to engage their normal behaviors as best possible. Now, we're not suggesting that you let your dog bite somebody, but it's just a factor that plays into what's going on here. And we need to find a way to satisfy our dog's innate needs safely, of course. But we need to be aware of them. So here's this poor dog who gets frightened and needs very badly to chase off these big scary vehicles. And he's never allowed to do it because he's on a leash. And that causes frustration. Okay? So just we need to be aware of that. So I went on to say that this boy's aggression on leash is actually a little different. He has a strong need to interact freely with other dogs the way he does at the dog park. Remember, he does just fine at the dog park, but on leash, he can get frustrated. We call that barrier frustration because what we, what we in, in veterinary behavior parlance refer to as an artificial barrier is something that prevents a dog from doing what they naturally should be allowed to do, but they don't understand. They don't really understand leashes or windows or fences or even the walls of a house. Most of them adapt, but they don't really understand. So, um, the barrier frustration is the common thread. Fences, windows, and leashes don't exist in the hardwiring of the canine brain. I recommend more healthy socialization at any safe and legal place where he can run unrestrained. Well, the dog park for this dog works very well. Now, leash walks will be much easier if you replace your terrierists choke or prong collar. These punishment collars can do us a lot more harm than good because when the dog gets highly agitated when seeing another dog or an unfamiliar person and then when they lunge and then they get that sudden stab of pain, that ratchets their agitation even higher and enough repetition of that and they have a continued higher intensity of reactive aggression when they encounter those triggers. Okay, So a head halter a gentle leader head halter. There are other brands of head halter. We, in, in, again, people who are specialists in veterinary behavior medicine recommend the gentle leader most often because 
It is something that is snug right behind the head. You attach the leash right here, and you can derail a dog's attention to an arousal trigger like another dog very quickly and take another, another direction. So as you lead the dog away, it isn't still orienting toward that other dog, getting f more and more agitated. You can derail them much more quickly because where the nose goes, the body has to follow, and you create distance. And when you're far enough away from the other dog or the person, whatever it is, or the noisy truck, whatever it is, then you can, Tony's standing on the uh, iPad. Anyway, I was just, they sort of do whatever they want, don't they? All right, here we go. There. Um, you, um, once you get far enough away, then you pivot so that your body is oriented toward the, whatever the trigger was, but you're ignoring it. And then you use the leash on the gentle leader to steer your dog's attention toward you. So by this time, your dog's rear end is oriented toward that trigger, but you have steered your dog's attention toward you. So eyeball to eyeball, leader subordinate, give your dog an opportunity to earn a reinforcer by giving a simple command like sit her down, and then your dog earns a pet on the head and a good girl and a little snack from your treat bag, and you have just reinforced your dog for watching its leader as a substitution for reacting to that nonsense. And if you repeat that a few hundreds of times, a year or a month, um, our dogs can actually learn in, instead of the old knee-jerk nonsense of seeing the noisy truck or hearing it or the other dog, to look immediately to their leader instead in anticipation of earning that distance so they feel better and the opportunity to focus on the leader and earn good things. So the gentle leader is a wonderful thing and it is not a punishment tool, okay? So it certainly will not ramp up the dog's um, arousal. Tony T, I'm trying, oh, Cora is here, and Cindy, and Joe Lynn is watching. Joe Lynn is one of our excellent nurses at the Veterinary Emergency and Specialty Center in here in Albuquerque, and has been very helpful to me on my cases. And she had a question, she contacted me earlier, so Joe Lynn, go ahead and type that in, and we'll address that. Doesn't have to have anything to do with what we're talking about. But it should be related to pets. Which I know it is because she just adopted from the Veterinary Emergency and Specialty Center a parvo survivor. I don't know the real story, but sadly, um, people sometimes leave their sick pets or injured pets and they don't come back for them. Boy. And I've been a veterinary hospital owner and I, I get it because I've, I've been to that movie. So anyway, one of the other beauties of the gentle leader is that you can derail these dogs often enough that their arousal each time they're exposed is so low that we can actually reduce the dog's sensitivity to those triggers. That's called desensitization. And then we, we reward them for something a little different using a, a treat, praise, petting, and that counter conditions. It's called, it's called desensitization and counter conditioning. Now, here's another one I got, and this came from a very close friend of mine. I've known this fellow for years. We've backpacked into the wilderness and fished together. Um, and he's just a great family friend as well. And he has a dog named Chrysanthemum. Okay, now let me read you this story because it's a little different. Our German Shepherd, Chrysanthemum, six months old, has fear aggression issues. So we've taken her, we've been taking her to Bullhead Park to try socializing, okay? Now, let me say this about that. Bullhead Park, by the way, here in Albuquerque, is a big dog park. And size matters, because the more they can spread out, the better. Some of these dog parks are too small. And when there's a whole lot of other dogs there, and they need to create distance from each other, and by the way, if they were free living, they would have limitless distance that they could create and feel better and diffuse a conflict. Um, so this is a nice big dog park, and we recommend Bullhead Park. But he said to try socializing, meaning that he's hoping that by repeated exposures to other dogs at the dog park, that his dog Chrysanthemum would be gradually less and less reactive. Well, I've known Chrysanthemum from the beginning, and I'm not going to paint all German shepherds with the same brush, but I will tell you that there is a problem in many individuals in that breed of reactive aggression. Uh, towards unknown, unfamiliar dogs and people. So anyway, socialization in dogs, by the way, is something that you need to do when they are between 3 and 12 weeks old.
That's the developmental stage in the maturation of the canine, young canine brain, where they are susceptible and open to being exposed to lots of different kinds of people, big people, little people, men, women, children, people of different races, people with hats and beards, and, and gentle people, so that they learn that hey, people are generally okay. And lots of other dogs of various descriptions who are nice, okay? And cats, all that stuff. Uh, the window of time is three to 12 weeks. So this puppy, chrysanthemum, is six months old. Frankly, that socialization window has closed and the ship has sailed. Uh, doesn't mean that chrysanthemum can't be desensitized and counter-conditioned. And again, using a gentle leader is one of the greatest tools for accomplishing that. But it is a very long and tedious and repetitive process. Not simple. We all want these things to be simple. Well, sorry, they're not. All right, so he's at the Bullhead Park with Chrysanthemum. There are five to six other dogs there, and she was doing her barking thing. And she does that when she sees somebody she doesn't know. Suddenly, some guy strode up and grabbed her by the neck, shaking her heart a couple of times before I shoved him away. And knowing my friend Alan, um, he'll do that. He pushed me, and Chrysanthemum jumped on him. He kicked her. He claimed he has been a trainer for 40 years. Another person told us he is a regular and has frequently caused altercations, resulting in police calls. You would hope so. He further traumatized my dog by his actions, and there is no question that that's the case. So, my response was this. Canine communication is commonly misinterpreted. That self-described dog trainer may have believed Chrysanthemum was dominant or threatening when, in fact, she was scared witless. Not only was Alan's description of this dog's behavior clear indicators that, that she was frightened, but again, I know the dog. Beyond regular exercise, dogs have a strong requirement for social interactions with others of their ilk. At dog parks, they can enjoy canine pleasantries like rear end sniffing and competitive urinating. For them, it's like spring break, but not for a wallflower like Chrysanthemum, who does better without all those other creatures. By barking her brains out, your freaked out puppy was trying to drive off those scary monsters, meaning the other dogs. Her fear of human strangers just jumped to the next level when that knucklehead roughed her up. Really, way out of line. You never go up to other people's dogs. Frankly, it's none of our business. Even I don't. Um, unless people ask. So going forward, you want to derail, derail the first hint of Chrysanthemum's tension and redirect her to earning food. After leading her several steps away, you can reward her for relaxing even a little. To avoid reinforcing the wrong behavior, be sure to completely ignore her when she gets agitated. And you've probably heard me say this before because dogs regard any response from a leader as a validation of their behavior and their emotional state of the moment. So if you want a dog to repeat a behavior, respond to it, and if you want it to die, you extinguish it by completely ignoring. So long term, a gentle leader head holder will be the most humane and reliable management and teaching tool. In the meantime, fear triggers like dog parks and neighborhood watch volunteers should be avoided. Okay. So additional information that I would share with Alan about chrysanthemum would be that maybe the dog park's okay, but only when there are just a few other dogs there. Find out when this knucklehead is typically there and avoid that. And in fact, there are some dogs who never belong at dog parks at all. Now, a couple of other things that I want to mention about dog parks. I am by all means pro-dog park with some caveats. When people are throwing frisbees and balls, I wouldn't go because the dogs will start competing for that stuff. And in fact, they can get so highly aroused behaviorally that some of them might lose impulse control and develop what we call play-related aggression. Large crowds of other people and dogs. Not the best thing for most of them. So early morning, late evening, go at times when there's not much else happening there. And if you see people with food and toys, uh, I wouldn't go. I just wouldn't do it. Um, it needs to be a positive experience. 
um, I would also point out to Alan that by continuing to expose chrysanthemum to fear triggers, like anything that causes her to react and bark, all we're doing in that case is rehearsing these neural sequences, these circuits in the brain that includes the long-term memory storage in the hippocampus. Practice makes perfect. And the reason that that old adage is true is because the brain is what we call a plastic organ, meaning that its anatomy can change. And that's why if you have a talented musician or athlete who is just top of the game, and you think, wow, what talent. Oh, sure, there's probably some God-given genetic talent there, but there's also been, those, those people have rehearsed and, 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 and practiced, practiced, practiced thousands, tens of thousands of times. And that's why they are so precise and excellent in their skill. Well, if we allow a dog to rehearse and practice these ramp-ups in agitation in response to fear triggers, they get faster and the responses get stronger. And if you want to look at it like being better skilled at something, well, that's what happens. On the other hand, we can teach them new and better behaviors, you know, response substitution, ignoring bad behavior, leading the dog away, creating distance, and then giving the dog an opportunity to earn good things from the leader. You can set the dog up to be capable of learning that stuff by allowing those old neural circuits to become weaker from disuse. So don't expose the dog to these repeated triggers. Okay, so Jolene, you may have had, all right, swipe left to reveal, thank you. And, all right, Jolene is here. Oh, Lisa, hello, thank you for coming. All right, so Jolene, uh, did you put your question in here, Jolene? Maybe you did. Maybe you'll just get a hold of me at the hospital or we'll talk on the phone. Anyway, um, so dog parks. I'm a big believer in dog parks. And by the way, um, if anybody here would like to get these videos, which I save and I post on my website, but you can get them in your email box every Tuesday morning. Just go to my website, which is drjeffnickel.com, D-R-Jeff, N-I-C-H-O-L dot com, no S on my name, and you can subscribe at the bottom of the homepage. Uh, you can just put your email address in there. It costs nothing to subscribe. Thank you for the heart. And every Tuesday morning, you'll not only get the video of my Facebook Live from the previous week, but you'll get my media blog, which is my newspaper column from the Albuquerque Journal from the previous week. And by the way, when you do sign up, uh, when you subscribe, I will send you at no charge my pet first aid and CPR guide, which is very worth printing and sticking to the fridge just in case you need something like that in a real hurry. So speaking of aggression, let me just share a study with you. It doesn't have anything to do with dog parks, which we're going to get back to that in just a minute. And this is uh, just published in a, one of the most, frankly, prestigious and uh, peer-reviewed veterinary medical journals called Veterinary Clinics of North America. I'm very fortunate to be published in there on cognitive dysfunction in dogs. Um, anyway, this is called Nutritional Management of Behavior and Brain Disorders of Dogs and Cats. I'm going to read you just a few, just a few little passages here because this is fascinating and it starts to confirm some information and expand on some information that we've had for a little while, but it gives me a little bit more support in making particular recommendations with respect to feeding dogs with aggression problems. Behavior is regulated by neurotransmitters and hormones like adrenaline, cortisol, things like that any changes in the availability of their precursors, in other words, the chemical building blocks of these neurotransmitters, the chemicals in the brain that transmit information between neurons and the hormones, any changes in the availability of their precursors, their building blocks, can affect production of these compounds and the behaviors that are influenced by them. Okay, And so we've got some research here. Tryptophan, which you may have heard of that, that's you know, turkey and chicken have more tryptophan than a lot of other foods, and theoretically it's the reason everybody finishes Thanksgiving dinner and then goes to sleep. Although it's been shown that there isn't quite that much tryptophan in it. Okay, tryptophan is the precursor for serotonin. Now that's a neurotransmitter that when we have a serious anxiety disorder in a pet, especially 
if it's manifest by impulsivity and aggression, we try to boost serotonin, okay? And that will generally help those problems. Well, tryptophan being a precursor of serotonin, lower levels of serotonin have been shown to be associated with aggression in many species, including dogs and humans, by the way. So by simply increasing the protein levels in diets, the concentration of tryptophan uptake into the brain can be markedly reduced. So higher protein in the diet typically gives us reduced serotonin because of reduced tryptophan, the building block. Okay? The result can be markedly reduced levels of serotonin synthesis or production, Tony, and subsequent effects on mood and cognition. Some proteins, like proteins found in chicken meat are much higher in tryptophan than others. So if we switch aggressive dogs or dogs with any tendency for that from dog foods that uh, have a lot of beef and other red meats in them to diets that have chicken as a meat source instead, we may be able to help reduce these problems with aggression. One early study attempted to evaluate the effect of protein on tri and tryptophan on aggression in dogs. Twelve dogs each with a diagnosis of dominance aggression, territorial aggression, or hyperactivity, plus 14 control dogs were fed diets with low, medium, or high amounts of protein for two weeks. Low and medium protein levels resulted in a significant decrease in dogs showing territorial aggression that was attributed to fear. Now, you know, again, we all want simple solutions, right, and quick answers. Believe me, it takes more than a diet change. But when we successfully manage these cases, it is because we have brought together multiple behavior solutions and integrated them and chosen them carefully for the individual. So for some dogs, um, a diet change uh, can be pretty darn good. So puppies, let's get them off to a good start, shall we? We know that that window of time where they are capable of recognizing people and dogs and cats and other creatures that they are likely to encounter through their lives and recognize them as safe and perfectly okay at window of time three to twelve weeks and that's the time you want to take a puppy to puppy class well does that mean well, I'm trying to swipe left here whoops there we go Let's see if there's any other questions before I continue um, Cindy Miller is watching Corey is watching Corey Sisk Wow, Porsche is here too. Thank you for coming, Porsche. I'm delighted when I see you. So, what about puppy class? I mean, should they get socialized with dogs and people at the dog park? Uh, no. Here's why. Um, they need to be protected. They don't need to get beat up, number one, um, and they don't need to get scared, and they don't need to be exposed to infectious disease because there is no way of knowing how well immunized dogs are at the dog park. But at a well-run puppy class, where the puppies, they're seven to 12 weeks, but their vaccination series is current. Now the vaccines in puppies, sort of like the corona vaccines that we're all getting, should be approximately three weeks apart. Now for an adult person getting the corona vaccine series, series of two is enough. And by the way, the same is true if we get an unvaccinated adult dog and we're gonna protect them against parvo or distemper, Typically, a series of two is perfectly good, about three weeks apart. But puppies carry some immunity from their mothers, and their immune system is immature. And so for those two reasons, we need to continue that series. Start them around six or eight weeks, probably six is a little better, and go approximately every three weeks until they're 14 to 16 weeks. There's a few breeds like Rottweilers, for example, that are more, and, and pit bulls, that have a vulnerability to parvo, and we usually run those vaccines a little bit later in puppyhood. But if we have puppies who are getting currently, every three weeks, their vaccination series, and they attend weekly puppy classes between seven and 12 weeks, we have found with a very robust research study that as long as everybody is, can show that they're vaccinated, nobody has gotten sick. And many of my colleagues in general veterinary practice are not aware of that, and many of them err on the side of safety and tell people don't expose this puppy to other dogs until it's finished its series, which is 
around 14 to 16 weeks, but the socialization window has closed by then. And there is, so far, has been no recognized risk if the puppies are vaccinated. So where can you go to a puppy class that has that rigid structure documented that everybody's protected? Well, I know of one veterinary hospital in Albuquerque, and that is the Aztec Animal Clinic, which I suspect is not doing their puppy classes until we start opening up the interior of our hospitals, which I think is going to happen pretty soon. And so if you're getting a puppy or you still have a young puppy, I would contact Aztec Animal Clinic. As I understand it, you don't have to be a current client of theirs. They will let anybody attend, and they do a good job. And these are puppies who are set up for success through their lives. Anybody ever been to a puppy class? Let me know if you have. I think it's a wonderful experience. You know, they can learn some basic commands, you know, like come and sit. They can have fun with the other puppies. But best of all, they learn that strangers are okay, you know, um, and they don't have to be afraid. So, uh, yeah, there are other risks. Uh, there are parasites. Yeah, well, you certainly want to check puppies for parasite eggs. Bring in a stool sample. And um, Tony, to your back, somebody just sent me a question, I think. Yeah, Isabella, the topic of tryptophan and also hormones is very interesting. In the human species, the medical community is still, right, there it is, learning differences between male and female. For example, are there any peer-reviewed papers you would recommend on this front? Um, I have this one right here. I would be happy to send you, um, I think I can send you a, a link to it. Um, I'll make a note, maybe Carolyn, you'll remind me. Isabella, if you don't mind, put your email address in my Facebook and I'll see if I can email you a link to this thing. I think you'd find it quite, it's more than fascinating. I think it's, it's quite useful. So parasites? Yeah, we routinely deworm puppies against roundworms and hookworms and uh, coccidia because these are common. I used to be a uh, judge at the annual science fair here in Albuquerque, and of course I judged the animal uh, exhibits. And there was a young girl, I don't know, she was like eighth grade or something, and she decided for her science project, she was going to the nearby dog park and collect fecal samples. And she went to her, her family veterinarian and explained what she wanted to do and could they let her examine these stool samples under the microscope in their lab. Well, like most veterinarians I know, we're very happy to encourage that kind of stuff in young people. And so, of course, she was allowed to do that and they showed her how to set up the fecal solution and how to spin them in the centrifuge and, and how to identify them under the microscope. And so she did that. And, you know, I'd often told people that here in Albuquerque, it's a dry climate. Um, you know, it's not, uh, it's, you know, above sea level by 5,000 feet. And we, we certainly check for parasites, but it isn't a big problem here like it is in the southeast part of the country where it's sea level and moist and really hot. And the parasites just have a field day there. And dogs are routinely heavily parasitized. They've got to be very careful with that. And I think not so much here. Well, she found that 35% of the samples that she collected had parasites in them at the dog park. Oh, is that a reason not to take your dog to a dog park? No, it's not. And if your dog is well immunized and you have a stool sample checked annually, I don't see a problem. If you go to the dog park a lot, maybe bring a stool sample in a few times a year so we can eliminate the parasites. The benefits far outweigh the risks at dog parks unless your dog has been involved in fights. And sometimes our dog your dog could be an instigator even if you think it's the other one because they read each other's body signals and they interpret threats. And so if your dog has been involved in fights, that's your dog doesn't belong in a dog park. So what if you're concerned about your dog? What if you think, well, gee, what happens if I go and some other dog goes after mine or my dog gets involved in something? To be safe, I would encourage you to leave a 20-foot long line, lightweight long line attached to your dog's collar so that she drags it around the dog park, even longer than 20 feet. You don't hold on to the end like a leash because then the dog's straining against it and starts getting frustrated. That barrier frustration problem we talked about, one of these questions that was sent in to me. Instead, what you want to do is let your dog have the freedom to move around. If you want to trot around and hold the end of the long line, keeping slack in it, you can sure do that. You're far enough away from your dog, you shouldn't be cramping her style. I say her because my dogs are her, 
or your girlfriend, um, so or him. But in any case, if you get concerned about um, problems at the dog park, you should um, pick up the drag, the the long line, and take your dog out. You know, you can learn from experience whether you're going to have a problem. And sure, there are risks, but your dog needs those opportunities to socialize with other dogs. Um, and, you know, you can take a basket muzzle too. That prevents injury, but it doesn't do anything to, to slow down um, these behavior problems. And, you know, they can get worse. Uh, let's see, who else? We'll do thank you. Welcome, Isabel. Um, Cindy, okay, any other questions? And by the way, you might have noticed, while I've been rambling on here, I've been picking little things out of Miss America's coat. And these are called foxtails. And let me show you what these things look like. If you can see them, see these things? This is a weed on, often called a grass on. And they have these little feather type things that have barbs on them. And once they get started in a dog's coat, they can work their way toward the skin. And you can see it has this point here. These things find their way down into dog's ear canals, uh, into their genitals, into their um, uh, anal glands even. Um, or very often we find that they make a opening in the dog's skin and they start working their way under the dog's skin and boy if you get a dog who's suddenly starting to pay a lot of attention to some area of the body like its rear end or its genitals or licking a, an area of the skin or ears don't wait because these things are manageable if we get after them early and they can cause huge problems they've been found in spinal cords brains uh, lungs we had that in a case of a cat who actually inhaled it down under the lungs these things are horrible, and this is the time of year where we start seeing a lot of that stuff. So that's what I have to report. So thanks, everybody, for watching. And I want you to try to focus on fostering a foundation of choice and freedom and trust in your dog because they need rights. People tell me they're pretty proud that they take their dog's food away or they kind of mess around with their dog while it's eating because they somehow believe that the dog will be more subservient. Uh, no, they need personal space. They have the right to personal boundaries. They have the right to make choices. And if we take the time to build a foundation of trust and choice and freedom for our pets, We'll bring out their best. Um, don't ask them to do things only for us. Because like people, they can be obstinate if all we're trying to do is get our needs met. Our dogs and cats can learn anytime during a relationship that they can trust us not to intimidate them. And that's advice that we can apply to those in our family and anybody we encounter. But we forget that with our pets. But they are a separate species and they have needs of their own. And they're going to do best and enjoy the, the greatest, most peaceful and fulfilled life if we take into account what, what they need. And somebody just sent me one more message. Let me see if I can get this darn thing to cooperate with me. There we go. And there it is. Um, thanks so much, Dr. Jeff. I learned so much from these Thursday meetings. You're the greatest. You're very nice, Sid. Thank you very much. Um, and next week, we're going to do this thing on Thursday. But instead of doing it at 6, we're going to do it at 7.30. I'll send a thing out on my Facebook because I'll be attending a continuing education webinar at 6. And I'll talk a little bit about it during our uh, Facebook Live. And then after that, I'm taking vacation for two weeks and you won't see me at all. So thank you again for tuning in. And everybody, please stay safe.